Shalom Aleichem, everybody. Thank you for joining. Today, 53 years ago, Mati Gur, paratrooper for the IDF, arrives at the Temple Mount and he makes a famous announcement into the Israeli radio. Har Habayit Biadenu, the Temple Mount is in our hands. I repeat, Har Habayit Biadenu, the Temple Mount is in our hands. After eight, eight long weeks outside of our miniature Jerusalem, our Jerusalem, our synagogues, many, many uh, people throughout the world are finally able to re-enter the gates of mercy after weeds are growing already on the synagogues and the siddurah and the prayer books are accumulating dust. The gates of mercy are opening again and people are able to come back to shul throughout the world. Many people in Israel, in New York, wherever it's safe, are coming back home like a child who's able to go back to his father's palace, like a prince coming back home to the king. But the true story isn't what is going to happen. The true story is really what has happened until now. These days of Corona will never be forgotten. Even after 20 years, we will always say this was our, when we personally were living in a, in a, in a higher level, a different kind of way. Our, uh, the law exempted us from praying with the minion. The rabbinate said it's forbidden to pray. But as King Solomon says in Song of Songs, the great waters cannot extinguish the love. And the Zoom meetings emerged and Zoom classes and porch minyan and whether they were legal or not legal, whether they were safe or they weren't safe, people weren't waiting to, for an excuse. People are trying to, out of love for God, whether they did the right thing or the wrong thing, there's this incredible love that the Jewish people have for prayer and for connecting to God. And this magnanimous spirit that enveloped all of us in during this time, trying to find a way to connect is something that answers a major question that anybody reading Ethics of Our Fathers would have. In Ethics of Our Fathers in chapter six, I'm going to read this week, this, this is the last Shabbat before the giving of the Torah. And we were learning Ethics of Our Fathers for six weeks. And this week we read the concluding chapter of Ethics of Our Fathers called Kenyan Torah, the acquisition of Torah. And in this chapter, there's a line where we say the words, There is no one who is free except for someone who studies the Torah. Just before I began this class, Menachem uh, Anlo Krasinski, who just joined Yeshiva Mayanot, Baruch Hashem in Jerusalem, who began his day, hi Menachem Mendel, is began his day at 3.50 a.m. today to join the yeshiva. And um, how was, how's it going? You know, you're up since three o'clock in the morning. How's it going? I feel fantastic. It's amazing. I love it. Not necessarily um, the way that everybody feels, but it's, it's incredible that this is, I mean, if someone's sleeping in the synagogue and here's the words, the only person who is free is someone who studies the Torah, they wake up. And if I would say this in my speech and my sermon on Shabbat, someone's going to wake up I'm like, yeah, right. The Torah says, don't eat this, don't eat that. Don't say this, don't say that. When you're going in the street, don't think this, don't think that. Th there are so many different instructions the Torah has every single moment of our life. Just in last week's Torah portion, God says, the Jewish people are called my servants, my slaves. So why are we saying that the only one who is considered free, says Rabbi Shua ben Levi, is someone who is occupied with Torah study? In Yiddish, there's an expression for someone who has cast off the yoke of Torah. The expression is fry, which sounds like the English word free, but it actually doesn't mean the same thing. Why is it that Yeshua ben Levi says that freedom is the occupation of Torah study? 
commitment to being a Jew. Judaism, Lahavdil, is different than all other religions. Judaism is not obsessed with the day of the week, with a certain space, even the, as holy as a synagogue, as holy as Shabbat. Judaism is holistic. It covers every single moment and facet of our lives completely. To be a Jew means to fulfill the words of King Solomon, in all your ways you should know him. And yet, although the, the Torah has, the Torah says that freedom means occupation with Torah. Why is that freedom? You could say that it's meaningful, that it's worthwhile, but why is it called freedom? You go to buy a suit, you have to check out, is this suit kosher or is it not kosher for a Jew to wear? The Talmud actually says these words. The Talmud says that although we have to be careful what we wear, we're not supposed to wear what's called shatna, is a mixture of wool and linen. That's how the big Uggs controversy began a few years ago. Are Uggs shatnas or not? Can you wear Uggs? But the Talmud says that there are certain people which are exempt from this controversy. You do not have to worry about this. Who are though? It, the Talmud, Talmud addresses, can you make shrouds, burial shrouds, out of shatnas, out of wool and linen. The Talmud says, yes, when you're at that stage, you are free from the mitzvahs, chafshi, free from God's commandments. So it seems only someone who has died is free, but as long as a person is alive, they are a servant of God and they're obligated to keep God's commandments. So it's confusing. Is a Jew a slave or is a Jew free? Is only someone who is dead considered free? Or someone who is alive and wants to live a long life, are they considered free? So the Rebbe explained this very many times, but we get a far greater insight into what this means in these last weeks that have just passed. A Jew isn't exempt from responsibility. A Jew is free. There's a difference between free and being irresponsible or not responsible. These are two completely diametrically opposed ideas. To be irresponsible, to be not responsible, means that someone who has no obligations, someone who has no debts. Freedom is someone who has the ability to, to move, to advance, to fulfill their dreams. Irresponsible means you're not responsible to get up in the morning, not responsible to uh, pay taxes. Freedom means your freedom to do something. In other words, there is removal of responsibility from other things. That's what chafshi means, removal of responsibility, taking away responsibilities. Then there's freedom to do something, to have a raison d'etre, to, to want to get somewhere. So there's someone in the Yiddish expression, fry means that you're exempt from responsibility. You've cast off responsibility. You're exempt from those responsibilities. But the word freedom means they're able to go and to run forward and to accomplish something. You're free to do. A, in Israel, they have this special uh, stipend to give soldiers after the army, they're free or they're exempt from responsibility. They stay up at night in, in clubs and they uh, leave pizza all over the floor with the, and they uh, don't always wash their socks. On the other hand, take, for example, a professional basketball player. Wakes up in the morning at seven o'clock in the morning. Right away, he's exercising and he's goes out for 10 hours to, to uh, practice. And he work, he's working in the sun and he's, the sun's beating on him and he's sweating. And he only eats those foods which will help his energy and help his speed and won't weigh him down. That kind of life, this very difficult life that he has is not a life of slavery. There's no, it, it is difficult, but, and, and it has similarity to slavery, but there's no freedom like this. This athlete will not exchange his life for any other, for any other promises. This, he's happy, 
completely free to be where he wants to be to pursue his dream. Someone who is uh, a bachelor who is not married and not tied down, he's exempt from responsibility. But someone who is married is free. He's living the best possible life for him, although he has to try to cover the bank and he has to pay for all these expenses because he's married. A wild uh, person who is, hasn't, doesn't consider the laws of traffic and, is, and he's careening around in, in their car, they're irresponsible. But someone who is driving carefully is free. A Jew isn't ex- irresponsible, but a Jew is certainly free. The fr- he is more free than, any, than anyone else in the world because a Jew is able to satisfy the need of their soul. The Torah is an obligation, it's a responsibility, but it's also a need. Just like we need to eat and we need to sustain our bodies, but we're not only physical. We, we are living a life of meaning. Food and sleep and purchasing things and going out to the mall doesn't satisfy us. We have deeper needs. The Torah is the oxygen for the soul. Just like the oxygen that we breathe, that it causes all the veins and the blood and everything to flow and everything to function in our body, so too the soul draws into it the the ideas of the Torah and it's inspired and it's full of energy and life to move forward. You don't believe me? Think about Corona. The courts are closed. No one's knocking on the doors of the court trying to, to make a court case happen. The IRS is closed. No one's knocking on the door trying to g- deliver their, their papers. But the shuls are closed. Is there a way, to, Rabbi, is there any way I can go to shul? Can I do this? Is there some way that this is kosher? The, the yeshivas are closed. Actually, the Mayanot yeshiva only reopened because uh, Menachem Mendel gave him a call and says, guys, I want to go to yeshiva. What are you guys doing? And because of that, thank God, he opened the doors for a lot of other people. Yeshiva is open. Why is yeshiva open? Because someone's knocking on the door. Why is he knocking on the door? It's the knock on the door is because of the gasoline of the, of the neshama. Just like a candle always flickers upwards, the godly fire of the neshama always ascends, trying to get energy and connect to God. There's a Jew named Mr. Ari, Ari Smith He's from Israel. And he said a following anecdote that he witnessed himself that was very meaningful to him. 1991, uh, he was in New York for Shavuos. And the Rebbe's schedule is very intense. He was, he was the first time there from in, on uh, Shavuos. And he saw the Rebbe, the Rebbe you know, is, is at that time, 1991, Rebbe's 90 and he is looking at the Rebbe and the Rebbe functioning the entire Shavuos, and he can barely keep up. The first night of Shavuos, we stay up all night. The custom in Chabad is that on the second night of Shavuos, you're supposed to go out and bring joy to other synagogues. Go travel, walk. Can, can drive, drive, of course, it's a holiday, but walk to another synagogue and bring the joy of Shavuos to another synagogue. By the way, I want to share with you something. I showed this this morning. Another talk of the Rebbe was recently discovered and there's a line there, which is incredible. Um, there was mentions this custom of going to other synagogues and bring joy to other synagogues. And he says that this, we find this interesting, um, interesting parallel between the amount of joy Jews have in mitzvahs, which is parallel to the amount of responsibility they have for these commandments. On Sukkot, it's a commandment in the Torah to be happy. But the holiday of Sukkot does bring joy, but not as great as the joy of Simchat Torah. Simchat Torah is a far greater joy. But there's no obligation to be happy on Simchat Torah. It's only a custom. It's a custom to be happy. But that, since it's only a custom, you would think it's, it's less joy. It's not so important to be happy. But there's more. There's more joy because the joy of, of the custom comes from a deeper part of the soul. 
it comes from a higher part of the soul, which can't be expressed in the written Torah. It's something beyond the letters of the Torah. That's why it's just a custom. The custom to go to other synagogues on Shavuot is not mentioned in the written Torah or the oral Torah. It's not even mentioned in the code of Jewish law. It's a custom that was just adopted more recently. And therefore, there's a, a, more, a greater joy in this custom. I think if, God forbid, uh, the synagogues in Los Angeles aren't able to be opened before uh, Shavuot begins, it's still possible to do to bring joy to other people in the way that's that's safe, and it's a it, and we should have tremendous joy in doing this. Every holiday expresses how we're one people, and that's why the Rebbe instructed people to go to other synagogues to bring joy, to walk from Brooklyn to Manhattan to Seagate for hours and hours in all of the world. Hasidim walk very far distances to bring the joy of the holiday to other people. So even if we can't go to another synagogue, but certainly there's something about bringing joy to another person and a lot of people are alone and just just going out there and, and trying to uh, connect in, in a safe way is something that that should bring us tremendous joy more the Rebbe says than the joy that you have with dancing with the Torah by the way it's not a by the way actually it's an important point to mention the blessing that we give each other before Shavuot is to receive the Torah with joy and inner inspiration those two words are very significant. Those are the words that the previous Rebbe used and the Rebbe repeated every year. Those are the words that we wish each other before the holiday of Shavuot to receive the Torah with joy and inner inspiration. Usually, inwardness is something that's, you know, it's deep in your heart. It's the way you think deeply. And joy is more of an expressive, more of an extrovert kind of thing. But the truth is that sometimes when you get disappointed, what happens is, is that your thoughts and your feelings aren't able to, you're, you're no longer able to express what's deeper in your heart because of disappointment. But joy has a, has a characteristic of breaking boundaries. When someone's happy, so then what's found deeper in the, in the recesses of their soul and their heart is able to come forth. And on the day of your child's wedding, something which is deep within your heart, some kind of deep, deep, deep feeling that you had that you didn't even know you had, but the day of your child's wedding, you're so happy that it just comes out, you're just full of joy, and you're zipping, you do it, and you're springing your step. And so these two blessings are connected. When you have joy, that allows us to have to really deeply feel the Torah. It's the joy that that tears down the boundaries that that will allow us to unlock the deepest feelings we have in our heart and our soul. So that's why these two blessings to receive the Torah with joy leads to the other blessing to receive the Torah with inner inspiration. So getting back to Ari Smith in 1991, he was witnessing the Rebbe's schedule and how the Rebbe encourages Hasidim to dance and to go to other synagogues and how the night of Shavuot, the Rebbe's up the whole night. And then the second day of Shavuot, there's a all day uh, activity. And after all the whole entire activity of the day of Shavuot, after it's all over, the Rebbe gives out wine for a blessing. Kos Shabracha. The holiday of Shavuot is over. Everyone goes home in the regular synagogues and, and they're tired. You know, it's a whole two day or three day if, if Shabbat falls out before Shavuot. It's three days of intense activity. And then, as it was in 1991, and then you just want to, you know, you want to rest. But after Shavuot is over, the Rebbe continues the joy of the holiday. The Talmud says, Yisru Chag Ba'avosim Ar'kanasim Ezbeach. If you connect the day after Shavuot, with the holiday of Shavuot, if you celebrate the day after Shavuot and you rejoice a little bit by eating and drinking more than you usually do, the Torah, the Talmud says, God considers it as if you bring a sacrifice to God. It's a special thing. But by the Rebbe, immediately after Shavuot is over, the Rebbe continues to give out wine for blessing to thousands of people, thousands, literally thousands of people, till two, three in the morning. And Ari Smith is watching the Rebbe after. Um, after he gives out wine to everyone, it's 2.10 a.m. The Rebbe goes back to his room, and Ari Smith catches a moment seeing the Rebbe in his room. The Rebbe, as soon as he comes into the room, the Rebbe takes a, a book, a book of Torah, and begins to study. That's, that's the first thing. This is what captured his heart and what caused Ari Smith to make many books, to write a, a lot about the Rebbe, and it expresses what, not just a great story of, of a tzaddik, 
but it also expresses what a Jew is and what Hasidus is and what this holiday is about. The Gemara says, there's an argument in the Talmud between Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel. They have a very philosophical question, a very fundamental question. Is it good that the world exists or not? And the Talmud brings different proofs that the world is good, the world is bad. And we recite the conclusion of the Talmud's uh, argument on the holiday of Yom Kippur, Ni'ila, and we say they agreed, Noach lo nivra, it is better not to have been born. Now, that doesn't fit very well with the, the Torah's account of Genesis. God creates the world. On day six, if God finishes creating the world, God says, Tov ma'od, it's very good. Is it very good? Or is it better that it never existed in the first place? So the Alter Rebbe explains that the words of the Talmud are very exact. Lo nochim, the world is not comfortable necessarily, but it's certainly good. To be a Jew isn't always comfortable, but it's good. To walk around and eat whatever is on the shelf is more comfortable, but what we need is something which is very good. A, a human being isn't someone who seeks to be irresponsible. A human being seeks, a Jew seeks to cleave to God, to, to cleave to God's commandments. And what the Talmud means when it says it's better not to have been born, it means it's easier. It's easier not to encounter the evil inclination, not to have to fight. That's, it's, it's, it would be easier to stay in heaven. And this also gives insight to the Torah's response to conversion. It seems like you read this and it's it just, any thinking person reading this is like, what are these guys thinking? If someone wants to convert to Judaism, what do, what, is the, what do the rabbis do? They discourage them. They discourage them because in order to find out if someone's sincere, you lock the door. And if they break through that door, you know they're sincere. That's why they discourage them. How do they discourage them? Think, think about this. How do they discourage them? They tell them, guys, do you know what the Jews are going through? Do you know that the Jews have always been tormented? They've always been hated. They always, always suff- they've always suffered. Do you know how the responsibilities that a Jew has for his creator? Right now, you have seven commandments. You join the Jewish people, you have 613 with thousands of details. And do you know that until now, if you would have eaten all these foods, nothing would happen to you, but now it's considered a grave sin to eat the following foods? And you tell the guy how hard it is to be a Jew. Be schwer zu sein, how it's hard to be a Jew. But if the guy or the woman is stubborn, they say, no, I want to be a Jew. This is the best. I, I wish I could be a Jew. So then what happens? Then you tell them, do you know about the world to come? Do you know about heaven? Do you know what it means to do a mitzvah? Do you know what a soul is? Do you know how special it is? Whoa, 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 whoa. Which one is it? Which one is it? Is it schwer zu sein, Ayyid? Is it hard to be a Jew? Or is it the most fortunate thing, the most happiest, blessed thing to be? Which one is it? It seems like the Jewish court is, is, is playing around with these, with these people. And they're, and they're saying, they're talking about two different sides of their mouth. What's going on? President Nixon uh, was once speaking about different members of the uh, Knesset. And he said, I don't get these guys in the Knesset. I don't get them. There are some people which are my friends. I know how to talk to my friends. There are some people which are my enemies. I know how to talk to my enemies. But these guys in Israel, I don't get this. From one side of the mouth, it seems like they're my friends. The other side of the mouth, it seems like they're my enemies. I can't figure it out. So Rebbe once commented on what Nixon said, and he said, Nixon never studied Tanya. If he would study Tanya, he would know. We have two souls. We have a godly soul. We have an animal soul. And this is a, the explanation of of, this, of these two different paradigms that the Jewish court presents to the would-be convert. The, the Talmud says a following story about Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva was living during the time of the destruction of Jerusalem. He was living at a time when the Romans forbade anyone to study Torah. He was one of the 10 people killed by the Romans. And before he was killed, 
he still studied Torah in public and defied the Romans' decrees. Once a businessman named Papas ben Yehuda walks into the yeshiva and he can't believe it. Rabbi Akiva is suicidal. He's teaching Torah in middle of this uh, ban against Torah study. How can this be? So he asked Rabbi Akiva, what are you thinking? So Rabbi Akiva gave him the following analogy. Analogy we discussed a few months ago. Analogy is a fox sees fish running to and fro in the water and the fox says to the fish, guys, so hard, guys running around. Why are you guys just running around in the water? Why don't you just relax a little bit? And the fishermen and fish say, we're running from the fishermen's nets. So the fox says, I got a great idea for you guys. Why don't you come out of the water and then you'll be free from the fishermen's nets. So the fish say to the fox, can you be considered the fox, the wisest of all animals? You're not very smart at all. In the water, it's our place of life. This is where we live. We go out of the water, we'll for sure surely die. So Rekiva told Papas, you got to understand something. I'm not studying Torah because someone's forcing me. I'm go not going to the study hall because I'm going to get a stipend, going to get paid, I'm going to get paid, I'm going to get brownie points. I'm going to get some academic reward. I'm studying Torah because this is my need. This is my soul yearning for oxygen. This is what it means for me to live. As the Torah says, chayenu. Torah is called our life. So what are you offering me to stop learning? Where should I go? How can I exist without Torah? We're preparing now to receive the Torah. A uh, rabbi was once talking about how the Torah is called the bride. And God gave the Jewish people the, uh, the Torah. The Torah is called the bride. The bride of the Jewish people. So someone is following this sermon. The rabbi is talking about the Torah being the bride. And God gives the Jewish people the bride. So he asked the rabbi, every bride has one chatan. Who is the chatan for the Torah? Who is, the, who is her fiance? Who is her soulmate that, that, that is only for her and for her alone? What do you mean the Jewish people are the, are the, are the, are the groom and the Torah is the bride? How could that be? What does that mean? So the rabbi said to him, when you go to a wedding, it's easy to spot the bride. The bride is easy to spot. The bride is dressed differently than everybody else. She has a gown, and no one looks like the bride. But the groom, groom wears a suit, nice tie. It's not necessarily so easy to spot the groom. How can you tell who the groom is? The groom is the one who takes the bride home. In a similar way, you want to know who is the groom for the Torah? The groom for the Torah is the one who takes the Torah after the Torah is given on Shavuot and before the Torah is given on Shavuot, the one who takes the Torah and makes a decision to study the Torah, to study the Torah diligently. There is a, a teaching of Rav Nassim Bar Afla, the, um, the, the um, Nassim Adler, the Bar Afla, he taught the meaning of setting a set time for Torah study in the Talmud, Kviyasit al is associated with a Talmudic word, Aramaic word, to steal. And that's because when someone steals something, it's because they have this frenzied feeling, I need this. In the same way, a Jew has to have that attitude to Torah study, set aside a time during the day that you need the Torah, you want the Torah, you feel my soul needs to breathe, I need to study Torah. You need to take your kala and bring her home to you because it's the Torah is your kala. So who is the groom of the kala? Who is the groom of the Torah? It's the one who takes the Torah home. Let's not wait for the holiday of Shavuot. God, Baruch Hashem, opened up the, the doors of many synagogues throughout the world and allowed the Jewish people to come back home. And may this bring about the opening of the doors of the third base of Migdash. May we merit to come into those doors tonight with Mashiach Tzakeinu and dance Sumchas Torah with, with the Luchot, with the, with the tablets that God gave us and rejoice with simcha and gladness forever. L'chaim, l'chaim. Thank you all for joining. Good night. L'chaim, 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 David. Hey, happy birthday, Michal David. It's your birthday tonight, right? Thank you. Yeah, sure is. Yes, yes. 
Happy birthday, Bechol Davish. And Ashnas, I'll talk to you guys Amen. What's your chata for your birthday? As as our says, yes. What's your good What's your good resolution for your birthday? What, what's your good decision now? Chitas in the morning. I like that. I like that. I think I should do that one too. Yeah. It's a good one. Chitas in the morning. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night.